Welcome to Momovate Momversations on the Win Win Women platform, where we women gather to care, connect, and collaborate. Truly a win win for us all. I'm your hostess, Reagan Barnes, mom of eight, and founder of the nonprofit organization Momovate that empowers you to elevate your mothering experience. Joining us today is author of the book, Love Your Life to Death, Yvonne Heath. And you, mom, you are joining us. And we are so glad to have you both, Yvonne and you too. We welcome you into the Mom of A community or mom unity, as we like to say. We are moms united in our passion to create a better world. Join us and become a mom mom unity member it's free on our website momofa.org together we'll constructively evolve motherhood into the 21st century meeting the needs of our children while elevating our mothering experiences um on our show here we answer the question what do moms do with this uplifting statement moms raise up society that's right not just our own kids but all of society including ourselves this acronym is jam-packed with the far-reaching impact of intentional mothers who strive to improve and progress in these areas of motherhood we're not just chauffeurs and short order cooks as we take on the repetitive loving work that shapes our children it shapes us too, and it makes an impact that goes beyond our homes. Because as moms, we are uniquely positioned to influence society one on one. Today, with our special guest, Yvonne, we're going to focus on the unique circumstances category of this acronym, which can include some of the more challenging parts of motherhood, including loss, severe sickness, and, and other difficulties. Yvonne will help us come to grips with these either before they happen or after as they might be part of our mothering journey. So we'll go ahead and stop sharing the screen at this point. Um, welcome Yvonne. Thank you so, so much. Oh my goodness. I just, I love everything you just shared. It's just such an extraordinary, beautiful mission. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, we sure. have a few details about your background that um, you've been a registered nurse in the past, working in the United States as well as Canada. Um, and in, during that time frame, you experienced all kinds of things, emergency care, chemotherapy, palliative and hospice. Um, and just during that journey, you had some, some disheartening feelings about the society's reluctance to talk about or plan for or prepare for grief. And, and grief can come through a variety of things, transitions and difficulties and, and end of life. Um, and without that preparation and willingness to think ahead about those things, it, it just seemed like the suffering was excessive um, and, and possibly unnecessary to be that excessive. Um, and as you pondered on these things, you were even experiencing your own um, difficulties and, and despair with a son who was going down a road of drugs and addiction. And, and so in order to manage your own feelings of hopelessness and helplessness and isolation, uh, you felt inspired to blaze a new trail. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and, and how that transition worked in your life. Mm, thank you. It, and it's, it, it's so interesting when you hear someone else saying it, it seems surreal, right? Because why would that happen in my life? I had been, that was my son, Tyler. Uh, I was a nurse. I was in Texas. I married and 
when I was eight months pregnant, um, I kind of had rose colored glasses on, you know, when you're pregnant and happy and glowing and everything's wonderful, doves are flying. And then I had this realization when I was eight months pregnant that um, I was married to an alcoholic. And wow. it's interesting because I was a nurse and I worked a lot of night shifts. And okay. so I didn't realize the party kept going, you know, when I <laughs> was working. And in that, it was just like that moment saying, okay, this is going to be challenging. So fast forward, um, I divorced his biological father um, at when, when Tyler was two and a half years old. I was a single parent for many years as many parents are. Uh, I tried to keep his biological father in his life. Um, he eventually just abandoned him, chose to you know, not be in his life. And as many moms do, you know, it's so much guilt. Oh my gosh, she doesn't have a father. What did I do? And it was a very dark time. I moved home, living with my parents at age 31 with my two and a half year old. And, you know, nobody has that on their vision board. And mm -hmm. in that moment, I thought like, what happened to my life, right? Like what happened to my life? And what I want to say right now is you never know what awaits on the other side of grief because course it was tremendous grief in that moving on I finally got a job at the hospital a little innocent flirting with a paramedic uh that wasn't going to go anywhere uh mm -hmm. we've now been together over 20 years <laughs> but then I had this amazing father for Tyler he adopted Tyler oh, had, yes it was so beautiful and and we had twins when I was 40 Hello. Yes, that's fine. But I can't brag about having twins at 40. You have how many children? Eight? <laughs> yes. Again, you set the bar really high. My <laughs> yeah. But it's not, like... it's not about quantity, right? It's about quality. <laughs> wow. Yes. Well, and you're smiling. Good for you. So, you know, here I felt like I had this quote unquote, perfect family. This man was wonderful. Tyler had siblings and everything was good. I worked in chemotherapy. And then it was so interesting when he was 16, he had, speaking of grief, he had visions of being a pro snowboarder and he wrecked his knee, like he had a bad fall and it literally destroyed his dream. And, you know, at 16, you, you feel like, you know, your dream's over, what dream will you have? And that's when his life spiraled down this road of drinking and then drugs and, and it's like, you're trying to hold on to this child, right? Like save him from himself. And I'm going to work in chemotherapy, putting on the happy face, pretending I'm fine when I'm not. And I know all the moms know what that means. We all, right? I'm gonna be strong for the family, pretend I'm fine when I'm not. And then I just couldn't do it anymore. And in that moment, I realized if there's a tragic ending with this child, because I may not be able to stop that, I didn't feel in that moment that I could survive that. And now I had other children, two tw twins who would also, you know, not have a mother. And in that brokenness, I needed to do something. Yeah. And in that moment of despair and the other piece of that was that people that I thought would be supporting me were avoiding me mm -hmm. because they, right. When you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say, you you're you avoid because you're afraid to do or say the wrong thing right and so taking that and and the other piece I just said I can no longer in in chemotherapy we're not having conversations about people dying we're you know here people are avoiding me I can't control this so it was either break or do something different and I could have never imagined you know all these years later Tyler's doing much better you know, we just, yeah, we kept showing up for him. And here we are having this conversation and there's been so much goodness that has come from that very dark time with, you know, I was inspired to do something different. I wrote my book. I became a speaker. I did a TEDx talk and, and, and I mentioned this in my talk because in sharing our stories is how we heal ourselves and each other, right? Yeah. He's not always having to be strong and pretending we're fine when we're not. So I gave all that up and it changed everything for me for the better. So that's, that's sort of a long story in a nutshell. <laughs>
Oh, but necessary, right? To, for So that we can see your vulnerability as well. Oh. And that's what oh. makes you approachable, gives you credibility with your mm. message is knowing that you have your own background with Oof. dealing with difficulties and challenges and um, and being able to, to kind of guide us through um, these these thoughts and um, and challenges uh, behavior wise and and whether it's our own uh, challenges that we're going through and we need to mm-hmm. learn to speak up and, and quit trying to hide whatever's happening mm. or whether we know of someone who's going through it and we can hear from you uh, ideas of how to not avoid that person. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Literally when I was writing my book and I just, you know, it was like this pop-up on Facebook. Cause I was like, I don't know, we need to do something in society. We don't know how to support one another. We're all pretending we're fine. And then there was a pop-up on Facebook, how to write a best-selling book. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to leave my nursing career. <laughs> My poor husband, I think he might've had a little heart attack, but anyways, and I just, I had no choice, right? It was like passion and purpose kidnapped me. I said, we need to do this differently, right? Yeah. And and so I wrote my book and in every story, I shared people's stories, it was incredible. Everyone wanted to share their stories with me, ages 11 to 101. And everyone had a story. Right. And, and it was like just healing, having this conversation and they were so grateful. And it was like, it felt like a therapy session for both of us. And all I was doing was listening and, and like creating space and saying, that's so hard. And I can't like, you went through so much and I would cry. People would say, Oh, what if I make someone cry? I think like we're terrified of emotion. Yeah. And so from that it was like you know people are so terrified to do or say the wrong thing and I started pacing in my house we need to just realize all we need to do we need to just show up right and then I was once again oh that (laughs) inspiration we created the I just show it's like hashtag I just showed up Mm -hmm. when you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say just show up just be there and be the shoulder to cry on make make it okay for people to cry absolutely hug text email calls I don't know what to say but I'm here and and it's very important we wrote I just showed up because the greatest thing that we can do is lead by example right I'm not going to tell people what to do I'm going to share what I did and in every one of those stories and in my life The things that made the difference had nothing to do with medical professionals. I mean, of course, there was a part of that and therapy and counseling and all that. That's, yes, a small part of it. It was the compassionate community caring for me, the compassionate hug, the the friend who bought my son a sweater at Christmas when everyone else just, you know, saw him as this problem kid, right? You know, that doesn't feel very good either as a mom, right? You know, I went, I went to the school before, like, while we were going all through this, and, you know, this one teacher just looked at me, and she was, does your son do a lot of drugs or what? Yeah. And I was, right, so mortified and, and just crushed. And then, and another teacher would say, you know, it seems like Ty's struggling. How can I help? I, I want to help. I care. Right? Words. Yeah. Choices. We always can choose. We always have a choice. We don't always have the choice we wish we had. Right. Right? But and we can choose our words. We can choose our words. We can choose to be vulnerable. We can choose to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. Yeah. You are not alone. I care. This is so hard. I'm a hot mess. Most of the time people thought I was, you know, really good at grief. They would always, when I supervised at the hospital, you know, especially when it's parents and they were devastated, something happened, they would, they'd send me in and I was so good at it. And the good was I'd walk in and say, oh my gosh, my heart is just aching for you. And I would be squeezing on everybody and crying. Yeah. had nothing to do with brilliance or my degree or what you know whatever I was just okay with being 
vulnerable and being a hot mess. I mean, it wasn't going to be, see, we don't need to be strong for everyone. We can grieve with, we can learn with our children. We don't have to, right? I don't know how to do this. Let's learn together. I'm trying to figure it out too. I think that is a powerful um, aspect of your work is, is and uh, as we talk to a crowd of mothers through this um, conversation or conversation, mm -hmm. um, is just the idea that we as moms are setting an example for our kids, whether we realize it or not. And so when we show up for our kids um, and we show up for whatever situations they see us managing and dealing with, um, then they can they can take strength in that and um, and maybe follow that example and just show up for their friends in times of need. And that and there's my yes and especially with moms because yes and here's here's the thing little the elephant in the room a little tough love for moms also and I've done it I know is you know if you want to be able to just show up for others you must show up for yourself first and that's showing up for yourself first I mean that's beyond self-care like walking eating well and all of this like we need to fire the mar martyr mom like oh you know she does everything for everybody else and she puts herself last and that feels like that's why you have value as a mom and here's the thing and here's why this doesn't work when you are teaching your children that they matter more than you and your you know, as a mom, your self-care and what you need is should be should be at the back of the, on the back burner, back of the line. What you're teaching your children is that someday they'll be parents, and then they won't matter as much, right? And they should be at the back of the line, and they and and so that's not what I want to teach my children. I want to teach my children that there's space in our day for what I need and you need. And sometimes, you know, your needs are greater and sometimes mine are. And we're all in this together, right? Like, and I, I mean, I've done it. Oh, you know, she's so amazing. She does everything for everyone else. And you're like, oh, thank you. And no, now I say, oh, I'm sorry. What can you do to change that? <laughs> so it's not sustainable or it's not that great example, right? It's not yeah. that great example. Yeah. I Hi, read an interesting um, little piece. I, I think it was kind of poetic. I, it might've been a poem, but it was, it was definitely a narrative as well. And it was um, a woman in her late forties, maybe early fifties. And she had just gotten diagnosed with terminal cancer mm -hmm. and her family wasn't um, like, you know, there are different stages of grief but they seemed really stuck in the anger part because they didn't know anything. They didn't know how to cook. They didn't know how to clean because she had done all of that, all of that time for them. And they just thought, oh, here we are losing our maid servant. Awful. <laughs> and it was so sad that they couldn't even appreciate what they were actually losing. They, they just, didn't know how to sh just show up for her. Right. They didn't know how. Oh my goodness, Reagan, there's two things I need to unpack there. So first of all, um, I have seven takeaways that that's the message that I share with everyone and takeaway number five is structure your life in such a way that you are self reliant and so are the people surrounding you. Yes. So a great mom, a great leader, a great anyone their ship continues to sail even when they're on vacation. If they're ill, if they're taking care of themselves, if they're away, they're, everything continues. So these moms that, oh my gosh, I'm going away, I need to cook 10 meals and make lists for my family. No, no, I don't do any of that, I'm sorry. If I'm away, I just walk out the door and everybody will figure it out because I, for everyone to be self-reliant, I know that I've done my job because when my children go away to college or university or you know give them roots and wings i don't want them to be terrified because they don't know how to cook right it's we're not it's a disservice and i just want to touch on the stages because it's funny so your dr elizabeth kubler ross um wrote a book on death and dying and she was sitting at the bedside of dying people and she wrote about those stages now 
that was one of 24 books and she never once again mentioned those stages. That was just for her to kind of help people to see that there's different things that happen. And anger is certainly something that we experience in uh, grief. However, I'm working with the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation to help the world understand that she never meant for the world to just run with this, these stages and say they're stages of grief. This was with dying people. Right. So the whole message is that grief is our mental, physical, and emotional reaction to loss, transitions, and change. And even in good transitions, there's grief and joy. And grief and joy is like a roller coaster. And, you know, sometimes you're angry, sometimes you're sad. Sometimes you're foggy. You could have a grief attack in five years. There's no timeline. And I, for one right now, I know I'm going, I am, I've got grief. My children are going to be going away. And I'll have had children at home for 30 years by the time they leave. Wow. I don't know how to adult without kids in the house. That's just <laughs> like, what? Where are all the kids? Right. You know, and, and so I already, I'm already, I'm already preparing my life for, right? When, so and, to, yeah. to know, and, and I also know that in my grieving, I will acknowledge it, I will allow it, and I know that the things that help me to feel better along the way, although there'll be days with like, you know, I'll look like a blowfish because I cried. I'll watch sad movies and I'll miss <laughs> my kids and I'll look at all the little trinkets and I will just let myself be. And if we can do that for ourselves, it's a beautiful thing to teach our children by our own example. Oh, I don't, I'm leaving. The kids are leaving. I don't want them to see me cry. It's like, why? You're sad. <laughs> because right. you love them. Like, I always hear that. Oh, sorry, I'm crying. No, God, don't apologize. <laughs> we're so hard on ourselves, you know. We're we to to we want to paint this funny, silly picture, and yeah, no one has a perfect painting. So, right, right? just love yourself, warts, flaws, vulnerability, all of it. <laughs> yep, yep, and and be there for the other people when they need to cry and and feel comfortable crying you know yeah. letting them have their moments and not uh doing anything other than hugging or you know bringing a box of tissues along or you don't have to fix it you don't right. have to fix it take that pressure off it is not your job to fix it this is their journey it's even like our older son i mean you know his he he still hasn't made perfect choices along the way we'll say and I know my role is to guide and step aside except that that is his journey I can share my thoughts with no attachment and then take good care of myself and allow my upsetness if I feel it and move forward there you go not my job to to chisel out his journey it doesn't work and you can't make anyone happy right we want to make our kid I'm going to make you happy <laughs> you can't make anyone happy right so so lead by example yes. be that person like geez you're always so happy why are you happy <laughs> and I will tell you one of the greatest one of the greatest ways is to is to be, just show up for others because it fills your heart and soul yes and be welcoming to them no matter what state they're in. Um, I appreciate you being willing to share that situation with your son mm. uh, because, uh, you know, many of us might have similar situations and sometimes there's mixed messages out there about how to manage it, how to deal with it. And uh, when you okay. first introduced that, you said, we just showed up for our son and that's what we'll keep doing. And I think uh, sometimes when we as parents are maybe disappointed in our child's choices, um, it, it creates this estrangement mm -hmm. and sends a message of, I will no longer interact with you because I yeah. disapprove of your choices. But what that child really needs actually is for us to be there for them and to just show up. And yes, 
let them figure out how consequences work, um, but not in a, in a way that is. Uh, well, you're talking about conditional love. I'll love right. you if you're behaving in this right. way. I love my, yes, I love my son unconditionally. I don't love all his choices, right? <laughs> right? Of course, I don't love his behavior. I don't love his choices. I love him. Yes. And, and so I'm going to keep loving him regardless of what his choices are. Right. And when he gives you a call, you aren't going to berate him for the choices he's making. Uh, but in I state, take deep breaths. Yes. <laughs> you just listen again for him. So the, the concept of just show up is both for the person going through the sadness of having a son who, yeah. who might be making those choices, but also for the son. For Absolutely. Him, him to just know that he can just show up and you'll listen and um, always and share whatever strength you can exactly and and i will just show up for myself first so that i right so that i i have and that's that was like coping skills and strategies and connecting with people who can support me through this Exactly. I love that idea of connecting with, with the people, um, it, you know, being vulnerable and explaining that you have this situation and then accepting whatever help they might be able to offer, even if it's just showing up. <laughs> uh, and asking for what I need. Yes. Trying to be specific. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Love that. that. Those fit in very well with some of the um, principles that yes. we for any of the unique circumstances that moms might have. And, and not every unique circumstance is a trial or difficulty um, in, in a negative way, right? Mm -hmm. Like for both you and I have had a set of twins and mm -hmm. most people who know you're gonna have multiples are just like, woohoo, that's so exciting. And, and then you still have to be willing to ask for help even about something exciting. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I, and again, in those wonderful moments, there's still grief and joy. It's like, oh my God, there's two of them at the same time. <laughs> A little panic there. Yes. And, and it's wonderful, right? I mean, there's, it, there's all of it. And, and you know, I, I, I even said that in my TED talk also, you know, when you have a baby, it's the most joyful thing. And you may also grieve your freedom that yes. you can just come and go as you please. And you may grieve sleep because, right? right? especially when you have two or more. Ah. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm really glad you mentioned the TED Talk again. We are going to uh, embed that TED Talk from the YouTube um, in, into our website where people can go and find uh, exactly what TED Talk you're talking about. And, Wonderful. And do it for themselves and, and be aware. Thank you so much. the message that you have to share. So um, we are going to go ahead and turn back on our slides so that we can um, end this recorded portion of our show. Um, so this is Yvonne's book, Love Your Life to Death, How to Plan and Prepare for End of Life so you can live fully now. But as we've been mentioning, it's even broader than that. She has mm -hmm. even more to say. Um, with regards to other oh, I'm not hearing you. You are robotic. I don't know if it's just me, Reagan, but you're frozen and robotic. Right. Thank you for letting me know. And I don't know either if it's just you or not, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but we will go ahead and use the volume on Mallory to say goodbye. Um, this half hour's gone by so fast. It's it time to end our recording and start our live interaction with our viewers. So if you've watched this after recording, thank you for watching and be sure to catch our live show every Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. So you can participate also in the second half hour where we continue the conversation directly with you unrecorded. 
We want to include you in the discussion. And that's how Win Win Women TV is unique. We care, we connect, we collaborate.